a few words after that, and then um, Michael will read uh, from the book. Thank you, Vinny. Okay, uh, I just hand you over to uh, our uh, city arts officer, James C. Hart. Wow, I get the feeling that this is one of these great Galway occasions. This is one of these nights that you would have had to have been there later on. So let's make sure that we do try to make it one of those nights. I think it's inevitably going to be one of those nights because it's the debut collection of the publishers, first of all, Amit's Publishing House, which is a great new addition to Galway. Congratulations. <laughs> I have to second the emotion. Do I need this? I probably do. Um, I have to second the emotion that it's a beautifully produced book. If, if the book I got is the same as the book you have. A beautifully produced book. And everything that Amit has ever done that I've seen, whether it's a, a writer, now a book producer, a photographer, a dancer, it's just been absolutely immaculate. So I'm not surprised it looks so good. In his intro, he refers to... I don't want to see all his good lines because he's going to read some of the intro later on. But, uh, yeah, where is it? He says here that, yeah. Um, it, is, it comes no surprise to me that such poets, such stepping wolves of the nighttime streets, well, Amit is a bit of a stepping puppy or second stepping wolf cub himself, I have to say, I've been pleased enough to encounter many times the nighttime streets. And it was in the best possible sense, uh, of course. And um, it was for both of us. And it was, um, I think it was Amit who told me first about the book, but I'm so pleased that, that this debut collection has come out from Mike. It, there is nothing on earth to equal the first time, and the first time, if you do it right, and the first time of a book and an ex or an exhibition is a really important occasion for an artist. So I am really, really thrilled to have been asked by Mike to say a few words about the book. I've known Mike for a few years. That's sort of a standard thing people say. But I have known Mike for a few years. Um, originally we met through a mutual friend and then bit by bit I began to realise that Mike was far more interesting <laughs> than the mutual friend. Circumstances <laughs> proved me right. And I realised that, that Mike was actually <clears throat> from Galway but had travelled the world and had come back here after a very, very colourful life, even more colourful than the costumes. And after a colourful life, he's been back in Galway. And he it's a perfect marriage, really, because um, Galway is the sort of place that we're lucky enough to see as is like a reservation of characters like, like Mike. And in fact, I think, to be honest, like most of us here, where else, where else could we survive and thrive? And where else could we be, be tolerated and loved and get away with it? <laughs> get away with it. So we have a lot to be thankful to Galway for. And indeed, on a night like tonight, an evening like tonight, when it's just enchanting to be in Galway. And it would only be for someone very special like Mike and some really good booze as well, I suppose, that would actually <laughs> drag us indoors on an evening like this. Mike's book of poems with some prose um, interludes as well is the journey of a remarkable soul and a remarkable man. Somewhere he says in it, I have written a million words and can make little sense of any of them. Well, onto that million words, there would be the couple of thousand words in this, and there's a great deal that you can make sense out of. It bears repeated reading. Sometimes it's actually quite difficult to read, not just because of the miniature font, but actually, which is really beautiful actually, it's not because of that, it's because it's so close to the bone. Mike's story is, in lots of ways, a terrible story, but he does triumph in the end. It's a story that takes us from, and I have to look and see where it is again. It's state of mind wherever you're at. It's state of mind, it's landscape, it's memory. It starts off in that cold season in our stone barn full of frightened children in the west of Ireland. And it takes us through some very dark moments. It wanders backwards and forwards in Mike's mind and memory and landscape. And sometimes Mike is the protagonist. Sometimes he's the father. Sometimes he's the son. Sometimes he's the grandfather. Sometimes he's the husband. But always he's the poet. Always he's the person who, I don't want to take all his best lines, but there's one more line I'm going to take. A fearful, frightened man, so scared, only extreme beauty made a dent. Mike's entire life has been a life in pursuit of beauty in one way or another. Sometimes that pursuit of beauty has pushed him 
very, very close to the edge. Sometimes the, the beauty itself is not pushed him over the edge. I strongly suspect. But he has, he has come back and he has put into words the most amazing story of transformation to where towards the end after some very dark days and some very bright nights as well but after some very dark days he is uh, written of as being absolutely clear and okay and sound and perfect and the last poem in the collection actually encapsulates all that I wouldn't dream quoting it I think it's the whole key of, of the entire collection and it's it's a remarkable story. It's a story I think lots of us can sort of identify with certain parts <coughs> of it. But could we put it into such limpid, fantastically beautiful poetry, such with such verve and abandon? And he has a way of turning a phrase, of encapsulating a very complex series of emotions in wonderfully simple, limpid, powerful poetry that will really stay with us for a very long time. I know Mike has a, a second collection well on the way due to the, <laughs> due to the wonders of computer technology which managed to recover a lot of lost work. Um, there's a lot of lost memories in this, there's a lot of memories retrieved from the ether, from the past, from other alcohol systems as well. But it's all, it's all in here and it's a particularly beautiful book. And it's a great honour to say that this beautiful book that looks so great, that reads so well, and that means so much, is now officially launched. Cochardicus, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Welcome everyone. Editor's Preface by Amit Mendy Rutha. I lived with the poetry of Michael Faherty whilst getting fat on donuts and beer and masturbating to cell phone pornography and Craigslist personals as part of a Narcissus Goldman dialectic in the city of New York during the summer of the year 2012. Andy Warhol kept me company as I contemplated and reconciled myself with his shadow and Amit Mehdi Ratha Publications was born. The idea to initially publish the works of others came about in a haze of secondary marijuana smoke, where Michael handed me his poetry and I read. My being affected by the work of another living poet is a rare occurrence, and upon reading Michael's words, I immediately felt a sense of kinship through being acquainted with the work of another, who is, I believe, directly channeling experience from an ancient primordial reservoir of original genius. In the legacy of the Schopenhauerian ideal, and indeed the young Nietzsche's conception of the Dionysian, the poet moves through existence inflamed, subject to a dissolution of self, as he communicates the anti-cultural origin of things, regardless of how he allegorically interprets this origin or genius, and exults in its schemas. It comes as no surprise to me that such poets, such Steppenwolves of the nighttime streets, are rarely, if ever, discovered and published in this postmodern age. Their chance to be thus is, I believe, even rarer in Ireland. Drifting on the outskirts of crowds looking in, and taking part in the world's celebrations on occasion. We recognise each other across city streets, in bars, on subways. And, in this moment of recognition, we understand our vocation, our family, its origin, its schemas, its nature, its ecstasies, its burdens, and the, inter and the inescapable interplay of free will, determinism, magic causality, wine, and the piper songs of Tragos. <laughs> It is, accordingly, my desire to bring the poetry of those who are driven by the impulse to self-abandonment in the legacy of Blake, Ginsberg, Nietzsche and Lang, and so forth, to the public, and to assist in the cause of their voices being heard by way of publication. This comes after my having published my own writings for the last 11 years. And so, it is with great pleasure that I begin the project of Amit Medi Ratha Publications, introducing first the very brilliant work of Michael Faherty. <laughs> And now, <laughs> introducing the poet, <coughs> Michael Faherty, date of birth 26th of the 9th, 1952, admitted 3rd of the 2nd, 2011, 
<laughs> Discharge, 23rd of the 2nd, 2011. <laughs> Bipolar hypomanic episode for a psychiatric follow-up. 58-year-old Irishman, separated, four kids, lives alone. 15-year diagnosis of bipolar with various admissions to psychiatric units, greater than two years without treatment. History of glaucoma, hemorrhoid, and renal tumor three years ago. <laughs> he presented to the emergency room complaining of rectal bleeding and urination problems. In the ER, he had odd behavior and conversations which ended with security removing him from the shower for a psychiatric consult. <laughs> in interview, he said that he had come to Lanzarote to visit his daughter living in Las Palmas and with whom he had no contact for years. He had no phone number or email address, but wanted to go see her in a fishing boat. He was kept under observation, and when his physical problems resolved, involuntary admission to psych. He cooperated. Euphoria, hyperactivity, verbosity, and psychomotor agitation. <laughs> Treatment normalized his sleep, and he was in contact with his family. History of peculiar personality with clinical symptoms. <laughs> after his daughter visited and said he was 85% himself. <laughs> he was discharged when manic symptoms subsided with family and they bought him a ticket back to Ireland. Well, I really have to say, wow. What a um, I'd like to dedicate the whole thing to my dad. Yay. I'd like to also introduce Margaret, his lovely lady. He's always got better than women than I have. I'll tell you nice to see you. There's a whole pile of thanks. I mean, Vinny first, because the first time I walked in here after I'd done something crazy in the crane, I, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure I remember it, because I'm not tripping now. He pushed apart a little pile of books and went, that's for you. So, Vinny, where are you, babe? <coughs> thanks, mate. Um, there's a lot of people in the room that did a lot of stuff that I couldn't do, uh, like type and read my writing and find it and keep it all together in one place. And it sort of floated around a long, long time. Is Mary Liddy here? Oh, Mary, you see, Mary's the first person to type this stuff for me. Uh, did Nick Yay. Bowers appear? Is Nick no, here? Yes, Mary. Is Nick here? <laughs> Thanks, Mary, I won't forget that. Yeah, Nick Bowers put up with me uh, going on and on and on and on. <laughs> I'm still going on and on. <laughs> and uh, Judith, I'm half here, sat down for a long, long time with me and uh, made, I don't know if we made sense of it, but it's, it's here, it's in the book, so something happened. And it was really? Judith, it was, it was amazing. There's a lot of people in the room that really have probably got the same story, I would think. And if you haven't got the same story, yeah, you have, I know you have, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, yeah, I know, you, wouldn't, you would, really wouldn't be here. There's a lot of stuff that I've tried to capture here. I didn't capture it. I'm still chasing a lot of it. Uh, I probably always will. But uh, back to my dad again. He could really have murdered me about five times and got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't a court in the land that would have been. No way. I'm not here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose really... Have I forgotten anything important? I've done my things. James, your ancestors. <laughs> your grandfather. Oh, they're all in here. Yeah, no, they're here. They're here. Oh, actually, now that you've... Oh, hang on a minute. Who said ancestors? Who was Me. that? Oh, thanks, Sorry, Angel. guilty. Well, here's an interesting one. I'm going to read this, because this is about all my ancestors. And it's not in the book, but uh, now that now that you mentioned that, I, this is just a natural one. It, this, is a, this is a woman that... You know the way... Um, well, well, of course you do. Some families are held together by everybody, and some families are held together by one person. Um, <coughs> this person, how do you do this? It was an amazing lady. She brought my father up to start with, so that's a good job. I think it's a good job. She brought a lot of children up during the war years. She brought up a lot of children in the 60s and 70s. She never had any children of her own. Um, from what she told me, which is very, very little, 
she was returned unopened. She told me that. And she's very highly thought of, but she had no family to do this, I don't think. Now, we were at a funeral of a woman of 102 not long ago. Is that right? She was 102 that lady, didn't she? And all the family came from all over the world. And, uh, after the do, one of her sons spoke very eloquently about his mother. And like an old stock Irish man, my old man quietly says unto me here, would you be able for that? Do you remember that? I do. Right. Well, I've actually written, and I've played with my dad, he's quite happy with this, to show him that I am able for it. I wrote what I wanted to read at my dad's funeral. I might go first, because he looks pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but it is written, he can probably read it at mine. It's about Delia Burke. It's about one day, it's a trembly hand I've got here, but I'm going to read this. And um, it's about the whole family, really. I think I'll have a go with this. There's no lectern here, so isn't this awful? My first book in the lectern. A lovely desk. Imagine you're at a funeral, maybe mine. But this is, this is about, I think, six generations of the family. These are the hands that caressed my father's curls, that cut the goose's Christmas neck and stroked the rosary beads that dangled, Golgotha, around her throat, that turned the wisps of hay back to the heat of the sun again and again and replaced the stones on the top of our walls as myriad as the Milky Way, year after dead wren year, and the litany of hundreds of saints and rosaries and benediction shitty fleeces packed off to the dealer in lacquer, stone free and over the ash trees, after rooks banded the whole place, and we fighting for kippens for the fire. The hands that bled on the way up the reek that very windy day, with a gale blowing penitence on the rock, slipping and crashing the flinty ground, defying each step barefoot up the pyramid shaping our lives at each unquestioned action, a blind leap over graves, and blindly feeling a universal pain, soul or solace until the reckoning. Daily, it drops unnoticed in looks and gesture. On a day like this, I don't feel like a blue primate, on a glass-blown melting plate, or frightened like an endangered species caught in a broken lift on the 13th floor. I feel those hands and icons, not imposing their ancient charms, but holding the truth. Now, I was going to do something really wanky and arty and say, yeah, I win. I win. I win. And then, oh, thanks, honey. Um, uh, no. Oh, yeah, arty farty stuff, right? Because um, I'm full of it. Uh, but none of it made it in here, which is great. Uh, it's not literature, it's just um, an open wound, I think, that's healing. Um, oh, yeah, the arty farty thing. I want to just stand here and do all those things that they do in those places, but I can't do that. But the quote was lovely. Um, when somebody asked Francis Bacon, who was just a classic lunatic, which I loved dearly, he, he was on such a, what is, the, what is it, what, did he, what was the question? What is the purpose of art? And I was going to leave you with this. <laughs> to deepen the mystery. That's what he said. I think I might find something in here. I'm not, I, I've prepared none of this. I have to say, and thank God you said something about generations. Yeah, go on, That wouldn't have happened either. Are you bored? Well, carry on. Random, <laughs> yeah. Random okay, we'll just have a little thing. <laughs> the first one. Random revolution. Oh, I've got a request from Emmett, yeah? Two years oh, all right then. Okay, well, well, all right then, we'll go with this one. If you could get Emma to do a dance routine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have choreographed this whole bloody thing. I should, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't try hard I'm enough, unemployed at the moment. You could employ me. Oh, come, come, yeah, by come and dance, like darling. <laughs> no, by all dancer. means, come and dance. I know he is. Yeah. Yeah. I know. He could teach okay, well, Emma's you. actually asked me to read this one. Um, so, so I will. You're welcome. Um, it's got a title. I thought the title was part of the poem, but it, it, that's all Amit. I, and in fact, to be honest with you, I didn't thank Amit enough. I just got to do this first. My stuff 
is in piles all around my house. And he accident, I mean, accidentally walked into my place in the middle of a dinner, in the middle of a lot of hash smoking, and I handed him a pile of stuff. I said nothing. He said nothing. Over a period of months, he managed to pull out all of these pieces all on his own. I did nothing about this at all. And it did that, so I thank you for that. Yeah, no, really great. So I'm going to read what he just asked me to read because that's the kind of a guy I am. <laughs> Right, two years before developing a moustache. <laughs> she cuts her fringe when she's anxious. She taps her foot. She cries out for forgiveness and bites her nails, frying her peanut brittle toenails, singing and sighing. Why, oh why, oh why, is the language a slave to Latin? An ocean, oasis of loop guru. <clears throat> SNR of the intestine, walking away from fire and meat and drugs and men. Will I become a nun and burn myself on the banks of the Ganges by going left? Or should I charge towards the crucifix of exclusion, sacrifice my beauty with self denial and some experiment fueled by saccharin, listerin, and hours of praying at the altar of? Don't look into the mirror of shame. Just keep praying and puking. <laughs> Baby shows a contempt by showing up. I've got to do this one. These are the questions that children ask. <coughs> well, these are the questions that children ask me, my children. <coughs> and uh, I have to say, I, I really do not evade answering these questions. But I don't like imparting what I know on top of them because that's a bloody disaster. <laughs> the first one was, uh, I sent my son, two sons, to a small school where they do a sort of a smattering of all religions. They don't do any, um, what, what the Roman Catholic Church is. I'm not going to go there, it's boring. But after a while, he, he did it on his own, and he made his first communion, and then he sort of gets to the bit where in the middle where you come to the confirmation part. And one day, he comes up to me and he says, Dad, I think he was 10. He said, I've got a bit of bad news for you. I thought, mm, yeah, what is it? He went, uh, I don't believe in God anymore. <laughs> so I said, why not? And he said, well, they're telling me that animals don't have souls. Is that true? So I said, look, Ushin, there's an atlas over there. Get it over here. So he flipped around. I said, find India. Flipping around. Bangs his finger on India, and I went, now, Washington, there's about a billion people living over there in that country, and they actually believe that the cow is sacred and God. A billion people. All right, he said. Now, flick it back to Ireland. So he does. I said, look how small that is. I said, that's about the size of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. Now he, he didn't leave it at that. It went on and on and on. I went down another. So I won't go there. But the other thing that's running through this one, when I got to London first, I, I managed to fall into this very high fashion world. It was incredible. The first guy that hired me was a six foot two transsexual in a frock, painted toenails, and a wig. And his name was Kevin Mayling. He was an absolute gentleman and a gentlewoman. <laughs> During the week he was a high-powered executive in a fashion house and at weekends he was Eve of the Nile and her snake. In the Montague Arms in New Cross. <laughs> now this is all, you know it. Yeah, good man up the wall. Down the road. Yeah, wall. Uh, so that, that was just one of them. And over the period of years I, I found myself working with people, now this is like 69, 70, 71, 72 in London. People were flying in from Malaysia and Singapore and Hong Kong and <coughs> places that, I, I mean, I went to school in Sherry Street. It's a very posh spot. I'm sure some of you must know it well. <laughs> you don't meet these kinds of people. All of a sudden, I'm standing beside hermaphrodites. People coming with sex changes. <laughs> people who were exhibiting in bizarre galleries of the, on the top. Just a different world. Yeah. But they were the same as me. They were no different. Yeah. And they treated everyone exactly the same. Yeah. They're in here. In the one piece. And I think the other one was... A very close woman friend of mine, when she was 12 years old, was in a classroom. And a 
You priests was doing whatever it is they're allowed to do. I don't know what it is they do. I've never figured it out. I'm, I'm not going to waste any time on it. But he was going on <coughs> about the Immaculate Conception and all this kind of stuff. And at 12, this very dear friend of mine <coughs> stood up and said, Isn't my womb immaculate? <laughs> She got chucked out of the school. <laughs> now again, I'm going to leave it at that. This is what I came up with here. This happened at, um, strangely enough, Aris and Vale, where I'm going to go later. And it was, on the, it was written on the back of a poster. When I get my new womb, it will be immaculate. <laughs> when I get round to shaving, <laughs> it won't be a picture picture. It won't be a pretty shape. And it won't be around my pubes. <laughs> and it won't be a tonsure on a Rubik cube. Rhyme and reason, shaking the past from adoration, built from dancing, dancing masks, moving on and off my buttons, sensuous delights. Not button mushrooms, exploding, inert for a time or an age, or a putting on and off of reason, exploding from its pace, of offerings, and sacrifice, inducements, and offers, not falling on the sword of futures proffered. Just a moment in the here and now, and not a stunned silence from a sacrificial cow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just flicking. I've no idea what's going to happen here. Oh, here's a sweet one. No, I'm going to leave that to you. I don't need that one. Um, oh, here's a nice one. Charity shop, madame. When I thought that I'd never see you again, I started to wear mad red shoes and wild red lipstick. Got tatted to death. Drank like a fish and danced my tits off. A lot. 